everybody and welcome back to another Wheel of Time video. In today's video we're going to be tackling one of my most requested videos and that is who are the most powerful characters in the Wheel of Time. Now in typical me fashion I have a crazy ranking system for you all and we'll get into that in a minute. But first, let's throw up a spoiler warning for the video. This video will carry a spoiler rating of red with major spoilers running all the way through a memory of light. If you have not finished the series, come back and watch this video once you have. You have been warned. One other real quick thing to mention here is at the end of the video, I will have a preview of the upcoming Wheel of Time community website that we are building and an opportunity for you to be involved in its creation and possibly even get credited. Make sure to watch the video until the very end to get a very special sneak peek. So in addressing the most powerful characters in the series, I really wanted to approach this from like a bigger point of view. It will not just be who would win in a fight, but this covers other types of power within the world of the Wheel of Time. If you've watched my other ranking type videos, you'll know that I always have some type of ranking system or rubric that I use to formulate my thoughts. For this list, I've broken down overall power into five different parts, each weighted with different ranking scales. The first criteria is fighting ability. This ranking measures their ability to fight physically. This does not include fighting by the use of the one power or with other special abilities, but basically their ability to fight with weapons and their hands. You can see the scale here on the screen right now. As this is not really a massive indicator of power, fighting is only gonna get a score out of five points. The second criteria is political power or influence. Overall power also includes those you can command or those you have influence over. So this criteria addresses the power that the individual has on the world, their region, and their local area. As people that command armies or control nations have more power than a good physical fighter, political power and influence will get a score out of 10 points instead of five. The third criteria is a character's effectiveness within the story. Having power is one thing, but the extent to which it is used is another. This score addresses the effect the character had on the story, and it will be scored out of five points. The fourth criteria is special non-channeling abilities and possessions. This score addresses the character's special abilities and powers that are not directly from the ability to use the one power. So for example, this could be the use of the world of dreams uh, as a dreamer or a wolf brother, but from not needing to use a gateway to enter the world of dreams. It could also include Terangrial that are consistently on the, in the character's possession, or even special skills such as healing, natural leadership abilities, or special powers. This is a big indicator of power, and so special abilities and possessions are going to get a score out of 15 points. The last criteria is the use of the one power. You can see the way the criteria break down on the screen here, but a few things in regard to the way I rank them. For one, I will be referring to the channeling rankings that I came up with in my video about the one power. If you have not seen that and want to understand how strength in the one power is ranked in the series, Take a look at that video, I will have it linked down below. But secondly, Robert Jordan has stated that although men are stronger than women in the amount of the one power they can use, the most powerful male channeler is roughly equal to the most powerful female channeler due to women being able to use weaves with more control than men. Therefore, when using the percentages you see on the screen right now, I've done a percentage of strength based on their sex. So the most powerful female channeler and the most powerful male channeler are going to get the same score. Channeling is probably the most powerful ability in the series, and so it will also get a score out of 15 points. In total, each character will be ranked out of 50 points. A few other quick things here about how I did the rankings. First, I took each character at the absolute height of their power. Obviously, there's quite a bit of progression and regression for some of these characters, so I decided to keep it simple by ranking them at their absolute strongest in each category. I have also only ranked characters that we have enough page time to really understand their true power. Characters that we only get vague references to will not be on the list. Also, when there's a tie, rather than listing it as a tie, I've broken the tie by basically picking who I think would defeat the other one in a fight to the death. I know that isn't totally precise, but it gave me a way to break the tie. Also, remember that my rankings are subjective. This is my point of view. I'm giving you my criteria and you'll be able to see the entire list on my Patreon. I'm interested to see your takes on the list and if you come up with something different than me. So without further ado, let's get into the 15 most powerful characters within the Wheel of Time. 
Kicking it off with the number 15 character on my list, we have Grendel. Grendel is a female Forsaken born close to 3400 years prior to the start of the story. She was an acclaimed healer of the mind in the Age of Legends, and later became known for her decadent ways after committing herself to the Shadow. She's one of the more powerful female channelers in the series, and she's quite intelligent. So let's see how she stacks up. For fighting ability, this isn't something Grendel is really known for. She's not known as a hand-to-hand -hand combat fighter, and we never actually see her use any fighting ability. So for fighting ability, she's going to get a 1 out of 5. As for her political power and influence, she deliberately does not carve out a throne to sit on, rather choosing to maneuver things from the background. She takes the role of a high-ranking noble in Aradoman, but lives far from the capital and manipulates other nobles. She does exert quite a bit of power, but she never really rules outright and tries to keep from drawing attention to herself. Because she never really had a throne, she's going to get a 5 out of 10 here. As for her effectiveness in the story, she's one of the more successful Forsaken in terms of her plans actually seeing some results. She's instrumental in almost completely sabotaging the forces of the light in the last battle. She outlasts many of the other Forsaken. She throws the nations of Ara Doman and Shara into complete chaos. And she almost single-handedly defeats many channelers at Sheogul in the last battle. For effectiveness, Grendel gets a 4 out of 5. For special non-channeling abilities, Grendel possesses great knowledge and wisdom uh, from the Age of Legends. She's lived a very long time and was one of the most knowledgeable people of her time when it came to human psychology and issues of the mind. She's a keen manipulator, even when you remove her use of compulsion. She doesn't get credit here for her use of the World of Dreams as she is not a dreamer, but rather she uses the one power to enter the world of dreams. So she's going to get a 7 out of 15 here. As for her channeling, she's one of the most powerful female channelers alive during the story and possesses great skill and knowledge about the one power. She gets a 14 out of 15 for channeling. This gives Grandal a total score of 31 out of 50 and she earns the number 15 spot on my list. Coming in at number 14 on my list is probably a character that most of you would not expect to see on this list. And actually, I was a bit surprised. But I do believe after further analysis that she deserves her spot. And that is the Aeol Wise One, Amis. So let's take a look at her scores. For fighting ability, Amis is a former Maiden of the Spear, trained from a young age to scout, fight, and she's proficient in multiple forms of combat. She's now a Wise One and does not practice the use of the Spear anymore, but she is clearly a formidable fighter. She gets a 3 out of 5. For political power and influence, she gets another high score here. She's a wise one, which means she has great influence among the Aiel, and she stands very high among the wise ones, actually. She only really defers to Sorlia, and she even challenges her sometimes. In addition, Amis is married to Ruark, the clan chief of the Tardad Aiel, giving her even more influence. She gets a 5 out of 10 for influence, as she isn't really a ruler, but really a high-ranking member of that society. For effectiveness in the story, she tends to be very effective at the things we see her do, in fighting and in using the world of dreams, in her wisdom, and in her leadership. The only issue here is we just don't see tons of her. She does affect people in events on a scale that isn't continent-spanning, but she does affect the direction for the Aiel, and she does have influence on Rand. So she's going to get a 2 out of 5 for effectiveness. For non-channeling abilities, this is a very high score here, as she is a dreamwalker and quite an accomplished one. She can enter the world of dreams without channeling and has a great degree of control there. She proves herself to be very effective in the world of dreams and is able to effectively fight the dark friends there. Egwene actually notes how strong she is. The only reason she isn't higher here is that there are characters that appear to be stronger than her in the world of dreams and seem to know more than she does. So she's going to get a 13 out of 15 for non-channeling abilities and possessions. Lastly, for channeling, Amis also has above average strength in the one power. She's stronger than the one power than the vast majority of the Aes Sedai, if just not as well trained. She would have had a slightly higher score here if she was trained by Aes Sedai and used the one power more. She's going to get a 9 out of 15 for use of the one power. In total, Amis gets a 32 out of 50 and earns the number 14 spot on the list. Now with the number 13 spot on the list, we have Elaine Tricand. Elaine is an Aes Sedai and the ruler of two major nations, as well as being the baby mama to the Dragon Reborn, and being one of the most powerful Aes Sedai of the age. So how does Elaine rank? Well, for fighting ability, she doesn't really do anything here. Uh, she gets a 1 out of 5. As for political power and influence, she has a very high score here. She rules Camelon and Kyrian, 
and oversees the last battle for the forces of light. She rules the most powerful nation outside of the Shanchan territories, and she is a skilled politician. She gets an 8 out of 10 for political power. For effectiveness in the story, Elaine proves to be very effective at claiming her throne, the throne of Kyrian, finding and using the Bowl of the Winds, leading the last battle, and taking baths. She's actually a major player in the story and she does get a lot done. She's gonna get a five out of five here. As for special abilities, she isn't a dreamwalker or anything, but she does have access to the world of dreams with a Terangrial that she can reproduce and that does not require channeling. Her main special abilities are her knowledge of the world of dreams of the Terangrial and of knowledge of people and leadership. She has a very astute political ability, proving herself able to maneuver as well as a, being a risk taker when it comes to seizing power. But she's also really good at ruling and understanding people. And while these aren't spectacular powers, uh, they're enough to get her a 6 out of 15. For channeling, Elaine is one of the most powerful channelers alive. She actually ranks within the top 15% of the female channelers. She was trained very, very well in the tower, as well as by Magidian, and she's capable of creating Terangrial. For channeling, Elaine gets a 12 out of 15. In total, Elaine gets a 32 out of 50 and the number 13 spot on my list. Coming in at number 12 on the list, we have the first of our Taviran boys, Perrin Abara. Perrin starts as a blacksmith and eventually masters the wolf dream, marries the cousin to a queen, then becomes a lord himself, then becomes the liege lord to a queen, and then the high seat of the most powerful nation in the Westlands, and then finally has his wife become a queen and he the king of a borderland nation. Not to mention he's a Taviran. So he's going to get some good scores here, so let's check him out. For fighting ability, Perrin gets a fairly high score despite not being super well trained as a fighter. He proves himself to basically be kind of a natural, whether it's with his natural skill or the kind of like animalistic instincts combined with his massive strength. Perrin's able to cut down Trollocs and Aiel in a berserker rage. Uh, Aiel, who are said to be the equal of 10 non-Aiel fighters, fall easily to Perrin uh, when he wants to fight. And while he isn't the best fighter on this list, he's pretty darn close. He's going to get a 4 out of 5 for fighting ability. For political power and influence, I already mentioned how high Perrin climbs on the political ladder despite not really wanting to be a noble. He fights tooth and nail to prevent this the whole time, but then he ends up as the Lord of the Two Rivers, high seat above all other houses in, in Andor other than the Queen, liege lord to Gildon, and the King of Saldea. That makes him a ruler with a, of a regional power almost on the level of being a continental level. He gets an 8 out of 10 here, but I wouldn't argue with somebody if they wanted to give him a 9 out of 10. As for his effectiveness, Perrin proves to be incredibly effective and necessary in the story. He affects events throughout the story on massive levels. He's part of saving the two rivers, ending the prophet, ending the Shido for good, saving the White Cloaks, indirectly defeating Masana, saving the Black Tower indirectly, defeating Slayer and Lanfear, and saving Rand from certain death. He has a massive role in the story and easily gets a 5 out of 5. For special abilities, Perrin has two of the most powerful special abilities in the story. Perrin proves himself to be an absolute master of the world of dreams, really what he calls the wolf dream, and redefines what's possible there, ignoring Balefire, saying it's just a weave, entering in the flesh without being able to, to channel, which essentially enables him to teleport and travel. Uh, he completely masters the wolf dream. He's also a very powerful Taviran, shaping the pattern in events around him. He's a natural leader as well. Perrin gets a 15 out of 15 for special non-channeling abilities. Now Perrin can't channel, so he gets a zero for channeling abilities. Uh, and in total, Perrin's gonna get a 32 out of 50 and earns the number 12 spot on my list. With the number 11 spot on the list, we have Ravine. Now, Ravine is one of the Forsaken and one of the most powerful male channelers of all time. During the story, he takes over control of Andor and parts of Kyrian and almost kills Rand. For fighting ability, Ravine's ability is never noted or spoken about in the same way that it is with some of the other more male Forsaken. But most male members during the Age of Legends competed and learned the sword, and they were very skilled at it, uh, just some more so than others. It can be assumed that Ravine had some skill there as well, and because of that, he's going to get a 3 out of 5 for fighting ability. For his political power and influence, Ravine spent much of his time in the books in Camelin. He effectively ruled Andor through Morghese and using compulsion on her. He never really spread his influence beyond Andor other than just a little bit into Kyrian, so he's going to get a 6 out of 10 for political influence. For his effectiveness in the story, Ravine was very effective at taking over Andor, the most powerful nation in the Westlands. Morghese was a strong queen and a powerful ruler, and would have been an asset in the fight against the Shadow. And he effectively not only usurped the throne from her, 
but he destroyed the political structure of Andor to the point that Elaine had to fight to take up her mother's throne later on. He really didn't only affect events in Andor though, and so he's gonna get a three out of five for effectiveness. As for special non-channeling abilities, Ravine really just has the benefit of knowledge of the Age of Legends and his manipulation abilities. He wasn't a dreamer, and he accessed the world of dreams just through gateways, and so that really doesn't help him here. However, his knowledge and skills with manipulation and access to shadow spawn and the resources of the shadow give him a 6 out of 15. For channeling abilities, Ravine is on the same level of power as both Rand and Moradin, making him as powerful as a man could be with the one power. He gets a 15 out of 15 for channeling. In total, Ravine gets a 33 out of 50 and earns the number 11 spot on my list. As we move into the number 10 spot on our list, we get our second Taviran boy. Matram Cawthon takes the number 10 spot on the list. Matt is a Taviran, and that manifests itself in Matt being abnormally lucky. Things seem to go his way when left to chance, and that favors him quite a bit in battle and gambling, and with just pretty much every circumstance. Uh, he also leads the armies of the light and has several other connections and abilities that make him a very powerful character. So for his fighting ability, it's pretty hard to top Matt's ability in the series. Aside from his luck, he's just incredibly skilled with the bow, the quarterstaff, and his Ashandara. He has quick hands, great reflexes, and has bested some of the greatest fighters in the world. He also possesses the memories of many other great fighters from over the years. He gets a 5 out of 5 here. For political power and influence, Matt does not begin the series with any political power, and for much of the series, it's hard to picture Matt having any. But he develops an incredible amount of influence and power as the series moves on. He becomes the leader of the Band of the Red Hand, eventually marries the Daughter of the Nine Moons, making him a of the high blood of the Shanshan, and the Prince of Ravens, and then he leads the Forces of the Light in the last battle, directing the war effort. Matt gets an 8 out of 10 here. For effectiveness, Matt is pretty darn effective at pretty much everything he does. He leads armies, kills the Golom, rescues Moraine, kills Padon Fane. He easily gets a 5 out of 5 here. As for non-channeling abilities and possessions, Matt is supremely powerful. For one, the fact that he's a Taviran, that he bends the pattern around him, really works in his favor. His Taviran nature manifests itself in his luck, which is pretty much unsurpassed. In battle, as with everything else he does, things just tend to go his way. This enables him to be incredibly rich as well. Additionally, he has the memories of thousands of dead generals, commanders, and fighters. This makes him the greatest general in the story. You can see more about that by checking out my top 10 military commanders on from the Wheel of Time video. I'll also have that one linked down below if you haven't seen it. In addition to the memories and his luck, Matt also possesses a couple items that he received from the Finns to boost his power. He has his Ashandari, which is a power wrought spear that gives him the ability to leave the world of the Finns. It's wielded like a quarterstaff, uh, which is Matt's weapon of choice. And then lastly, he has the Foxhead Medallion, which prevents flows of the One Power from touching him. This makes him extremely deadly to channelers, as he's already a dangerous fighter and lucky beyond belief, and then he's immune to the One Power. Uh, he's just a very powerful character within the series, so for non-channeling abilities, Matt's going to get a 15 out of 15. When it comes to channeling, Matt can't channel, so he gets a 0 out of 15 here. In total, Matt gets a 33 out of 50 and earns the number 10 spot on my list. With the number 9 spot on the list, we have Nynaeve Almira, Wisdom from Emmons Field, Aes Sedai of the Yellow Aja, and Wife to the King of Malkir. Nynaeve is one of the most powerful female channelers in the series, besting even some of the Forsaken in her strength. She's an incredibly accomplished healer, she's a loyal caregiver to her friends, and she plays a pivotal role in the victory of the Forces of the Light. So let's first take a look at Nynaeve's fighting abilities. Now, Nynaeve is not known as a fighter, but she has shown herself capable at sneaking around and at defending herself physically at times. She claims to be a coward, but consistently shows herself to be capable of great courage. And while not a great fighter, she's at least capable of defending herself and surviving with some skill. She gets a 2 out of 5 here. For her political power and influence, her main power and influence in the series stems from a few things. For one, she's an Aes Sedai, albeit a young one without connections. Uh, she is, however, a very powerful Aes Sedai, and so that puts her at the top of the pecking order among the Aes Sedai themselves. She's also married to Lan Mandragoran, the king of Malkir, which Malkir is actually reborn at the end of the series. So regardless of the power that Malkir regains, this also makes her very powerful among the borderland nations, 
as Malkir is very well respected. Lastly, she is the friend of the Dragon Reborn, which gives her some degree of authority as well in the lands that he controls. Now, despite all this, Nynaeve never really rules a land or controls people, and she does not even command an army. Her influence is more subtle, and because of her young age, she doesn't quite have this strong amount of influence that, with rulers that other more distinguished Aes Sedai might. Therefore, she gets a 5 out of 10 for political power and influence. As for her effectiveness in the series, Nynaeve actually accomplishes quite a bit. She bests one of the Forsaken twice, while she herself was barely even trained. She heals stilling and madness, something that most thought was impossible. She was part of the cleansing of Sidene and the closing of the boar during the last battle, and she sets in motion the events that lead to Lan raising the Golden Crane and defending Tarwin's Gap during the last battle. She was incredibly effective across a great scale, and so for this, Nynaeve gets a 4 out of 5 for her effectiveness. In terms of non-channeling abilities and possessions, most of Nynaeve's power here comes from her collection of Terangrial that she carries. The reason these are added here is that they give her great utility and make her a very dangerous opponent. She carries a Tarangrial that functions similar to Matt's Foxhead Medallion, in that it melts weaves away that are aimed at her. Other Tarangrial that she has detect men and women channeling. She possesses a ring that allows her to enter the World of Dreams for a time without channeling. She also does possess some knowledge of the World of Dreams and other survival knowledge in, in the real world that boosts her score here as well. Nynaeve is an accomplished tracker and woods person. She's able to track Lan, who's one of the more accomplished characters in the series. This is actually what begun their relationship. Uh, she understands herbs and healing even without the power. And so all this together kind of gives her a score of 10 out of 15 for non-channeling abilities and possessions. For channeling abilities, Nynaeve is one of the most powerful female channelers in the series. And it's thought that she hasn't even hit her full potential by the end of the books. She's almost at the top of the potential for female channelers. She is less trained and experienced than some of the other channelers at her same power level, especially the Forsaken. But while she is stronger than some of the Forsaken, there are still others that are stronger than her and have more knowledge and experience. And so because of this, Nynaeve gets a 13 out of 15. In total, Nynaeve Almira gets a 34 out of 50 and earns the number 9 spot on my list. With the number 8 spot, we have Cad Swain Melidrin, a very old and very accomplished Aes Sedai of the Green Aja. Cad Swain is a legend among Aes Sedai and earned her reputation. She was strong in the power, strong in personality, and quite intelligent and capable. So when it comes to fighting ability, this isn't exactly Cad Swain's sweet spot. She's at the end of her life, most likely, and so physical combat is not really her thing. She isn't incapable, she's just... This just isn't her strong point. She gets a 1 out of 5 here. For political power and influence, Cad Swain is an interesting one here. Uh, she doesn't outright rule anything, although it's implied at the end of the novels that she will be the new Amarlin seat, which would make her very powerful. Despite the lack of outright power, uh, she is very influential on a large scale. For one, she's Aes Sedai, which by itself would give her a higher score. But add to that that she is very powerful and has a legendary status among other Aes Sedai, she's the de facto leader whenever she's present. She seems to be able to lead when she's not the strongest in the power, essentially turning the Aes Sedai hierarchy on its head. She also seems to have significant control and power over various monarchs and rulers, seemingly kidnapping and controlling whoever she chooses to. So she doesn't outright rule, but she does have great amount of influence. And so she's going to get a 7 out of 10 for political influence here. For her effectiveness, she is extremely effective in her goals. She seems to get her way in most situations, and she seems to succeed in most things she does. She was able to break Samarag uh, to a degree, which is something that many didn't think possible. She was able to influence Rand where others could not. She led the defense of Rand at Shadar Logoth and had a strong defense at Sheo Ghul. There never seems to be much that she can't do, and so she's going to get a 4 out of 5 for effectiveness. When it comes to special non-channeling abilities and possessions, Cad Swain really falls in the same boat here as Nynaeve. She carries a Paralysis Net just like Nynaeve that has pretty much the same Tarangrial that let her resist the power, give her armor that'll stop blades, detect a man channeling, that kind of thing. She also has significant intelligence and knowledge that she's gained over her roughly 300 year lifetime. She gets a 10 out of 15 here. For channeling abilities, prior to the coming of Egwene, Elaine, and Nynaeve, Cad Swain was considered to be the strongest living Aes Sedai. Even though she doesn't carry that title still, she's still among the very strongest and the most skilled. She gets a 12 out of 15 for channeling ability. In total, Cad Swain gets a 34 out of 50 and earns the number 8 spot on my list. Coming in at the number 7 spot, we have another Forsaken, and this one might be a surprise to some because he's barely in the story, 
But I do think he earns this spot if you kind of pay attention to the criteria, and that is, of course, Bilal. Bilal was also known as the Netweaver. He maneuvered events throughout the Dragon Reborn, and he was an accomplished general, fighter, and powerful user of the One Power and he ruled a nation. So when it comes to fighting ability, Bilal was said to be a master of the sword. He was considered the strongest of the Forsaken when it comes to the sword and combat, and he was just really, really skilled. He gets a five out of five here. When it comes to political power and influence, he essentially ruled the nation of Tyr as the High Lord Salmon. Although he wasn't the king, he had a great deal of control over the nation. He gets a five out of 10 for political power and influence. For effectiveness, he's a mixed bag here. So he was very effective at setting the trap for Rand to get a hold of Kalindor, in fact, he got Rand to draw it. However, his plans ultimately failed when Moraine sneaked up and bail fired him. He was really overconfident. And so he was able to manipulate events though, uh, from the kidnapping of Elaine, Egwene, and Nynaeve to luring Rand in. He really did earn his name as the Netweaver, so he's gonna get a three out of five here. As to special non-channeling abilities, he was an accomplished general. Uh, just as accomplished as Demon Dread or Semiel. He had knowledge of the Age of Legends and was a very, very gifted manipulator and strategist. He beat Luz there in Telamon in Stones, which was considered quite a feat. He gets a 9 out of 15 for special non-channeling abilities and possessions. As for his channeling ability, he's one of the Forsaken. He's extremely powerful. He's just the weakest of the Forsaken. He's significantly stronger, though, than most of the characters in the series, but just not on the same level as the other male Forsaken or Rand. He gets a 12 out of 15 here. In total, Bilal gets a 34 out of 50 and earns the number 7 spot on my list. At the number 6 spot, we have Semiel. Semiel is a bitter enemy of Luz Theron Telamon and was labeled the destroyer of hope for his great betrayal of an entire city to the shadow during the Age of Legends. He's a great tactician and military commander and is one of the Forsaken. So what about his fighting ability? Well, he was not accounted as one of the great swordsmen of his day, but he did know how and he was proficient. So he's gonna get a three out of five here. As for his political power and influence, Samael ruled over Ilian almost absolutely. Despite not really having the crown, he controlled the military and most of the economy, and because of his control over the nation as a whole, he gets a 6 out of 10 for political power. For his effectiveness in the story, it's sort of a mixed bag again here for Semiel. He does something that certainly has influence over events and plays a large role, but he also overestimates his own strength and makes foolish assumptions that end up getting him killed. He does scatter the Shido, which causes quite a bit of chaos throughout the world. He sends the Golam to Ebu Dar and to search for the cache of objects of power as well, which certainly affects the plot. He gets a three out of five for effectiveness. Now for special non-channeling abilities, his main reason for a high score here is that he's a gifted military commander and strategist, although his strength was in defensive situations. He also has vast knowledge from the Age of Legends, and he's someone that's really skilled at manipulation. He gets a 9 out of 15 here. As for channeling, he's one of the stronger channelers in the story, and again, he's one of the Forsaken, meaning he's one of the strongest from the Age of Legends as well. He gets a 14 out of 15 for channeling ability. In total, Samael gets a 35 out of 50 and earns the number 6 spot on my list. Breaking into the number 5 spot on the list, we have the Daughter of the Night herself, Lanfear. Lanfear is the most powerful female Forsaken in terms of strength and one of the most feared people of all time. Lanfear is not a hand-to-hand -hand fighter and does not show any ability with hand-to-hand -hand combat. She gets a one out of five here. For her political power and influence, she really does not insert herself into politics or really attempt to have any influence. Her efforts seem largely based on Rand and swaying him to her side. The most power she does seem to show politically is when she leads the group of dark friends into the waste in the Shadow Rising. Obviously, she certainly would have been capable of more, she just didn't, and so she gets a two out of 10 here. For her effectiveness in the story, now this is really a mixed bag, I keep saying that, uh, but she actually keeps Rand alive after the Battle of Falma. She heals him, I don't know if many people caught that. She helps to teach him to channel through trapping Asmodian. Without this, Rand might have died. Uh, now she didn't exactly help the forces of Shadow much, uh, but it was her intention that he lived, and it was her intention that he learned to channel. And so we can't say it wasn't on purpose. In terms of her schemes and machinations though, she does almost kill Rand, and she does remove Moraine from Rand's side when uh, he would have really needed her the most. And so for effectiveness, Lanfear gets a 3 out of 5. For special non-channeling abilities, Lanfear is going to rate very high. She's a dreamer as far as we can tell, meaning she has the ability to access the world of dreams without using the power, although she does enter in the flesh at times for added strength. She refers to herself as the master of the world of dreams and demonstrates great knowledge and power there. She has great knowledge in, of the world and of science, having been a preeminent researcher at the Kolom Dawn before the drilling of the boar, which actually she took part in doing. Because of her great strength in the world of dreams and her great 
great knowledge. She gets a 14 out of 15 for special non-channeling abilities and possessions. As for her strength in the power, she is literally as strong as a woman can be in the power, and so she gets a 15 out of 15. In total, Lanfear gets a 35 out of 50 and earns the number 5 spot on my list. Coming in at the number 4 spot on the list, we have Demon Dread, another extremely powerful male Forsaken with a deep hatred for Luz Theron Telemon. He would have been the greatest man in the Age of Legends had it not been for Luz Theron, uh, and he almost single-handedly wins the last battle for the Forces of the Shadow. So in terms of his fighting ability, Demon Dread is considered uh, extremely gifted as a swordsman and as a fighter. Land considers him better than he, and he was able to defeat multiple Blade Masters that were all enhanced with some sort of power one way or the other. He gets a 5 out of 5 here. In terms of political power and influence, he ended up leading an uprising of slaves in Shara, and rose to lead a large part of their army and of their channelers. Contrary to what many assume, he did not actually rule the entire nation of Shara, but rather a portion of it, and a large number of the Ayad, or the Sharan channelers. Given that the Sharan people essentially dominate an entire continent, and he ruled a portion of them, he's going to get an 8 out of 10 here. In terms of his effectiveness in the story, he was effective in bringing the Sharans into the last battle and almost winning it for the Shadow. He was also instrumental in the corruption of the Black Tower and the finding of Taim. His only knock here is how ridiculous he was in calling out Luz Theron over and over and over again in the last battle rather than finishing the Forces of the Light. He gets a 4 out of 5 here for effectiveness. For special non-channeling abilities and possessions, his score here comes from the fact that he was a very gifted general, basically almost the equal of Matt uh, with all of his memories, as well as having vast knowledge from the Age of Legends. He gets a 9 out of 15 here. Lastly, for his channeling abilities, he is just behind the most powerful male channelers of all time, just not quite on the top tier, uh, but still extremely powerful. He gets a 14 out of 15 for channeling abilities. In total, Demon Dread gets a 40 out of 50 and earns the number 4 spot on the list. With the number 3 spot on the list, we have Egwene Alvir, the Omerlin Seed, Dreamwalker, and friend of Randall Thor. For fighting ability, Egwene is not really a fighter with weapons, but she is capable of defending herself. She grew up in the Two Rivers and could track and sneak about and had some capability with a bow, but certainly not an expert with anything. She gets a 2 out of 5. For her political power and influence, she is an exceptionally skilled politician as the Omerlin in her brief time in the role. She rules the White Tower and reunites it under her leadership and leads them into the last battle. The Omerlin seat has a great deal of influence around the world, and with the last battle on the horizon, the Omerlin seat had even greater influence than any time in centuries, basically, uh, because at that point, pretty much all the nations respected the position, even the White Cloaks. She also has a great deal of influence among the Wise Ones with the Aiel. Egwene gets a 9 out of 10 for political power and influence. As for effectiveness, Egwene is one of the most effective characters in the series, to the point that many call her a Mary Sue character. She masterfully manipulates the Aes Sedai into making her one of the more powerful Amarlin seats of all time, despite only being 18. She brings the rulers of the nations together to confront Rand. She brings the Aiel, Seafolk, Kin, and Aes Sedai together and unites them to a degree and makes a deal that allows them to train each other. She eliminates Mazram Taim and the Sharn Channelers during the last battle. She gets a 5 out of 5 for effectiveness. For her non-channeling uh, abilities, she's exceptionally powerful as a Dreamwalker, having mastered it in a very short period of time with training from the Wise Ones. They tell her that, they, that she will surpass their ability, and she does. She's able to manipulate the Dream on a level that even the other Forsaken are unable to really achieve. Uh, she defeats Masana there. She gets a 14 out of 15. For channeling abilities, Egwene is exceptionally strong by Aes Sedai standards, but not on the level of the Forsaken or the other top-level female channelers. She gets a 12 out of 15 here. In total, Egwene gets a 42 out of 50 and earns the number 3 spot on the list. Coming in at the number 2 spot on the list, we have a Shamael and his later reincarnated form of Morden. Morden is the leader of the Forces of the Shadow, also known as the Nablus. Uh, a Dreamwalker, and an exceptionally powerful user of the One Power and the True Power. He's essentially the champion of the Dark One, and so for fighting ability, this is not exactly his most powerful trait, but he is able to hold his own against Rand, uh, for a time at least. He's not a master by any right, but he is certainly not incapable. He gets a 3 out of 5. For political power and influence, he's extremely powerful here, as he oversees all of the forces of the Shadow, from the Forsaken, Dark Friends, Shadow Spawn, the Black Aja... He has access to great resources. He's manipulated events for thousands of years. He gets a 10 out of 10 for political power and influence. For effectiveness, Morden has manipulated events in the world for thousands of years. 
He's responsible for the breakup of Ardor Hawkwing's empire. He orchestrated the Trolloc Wars. He created the Black Ajra and the large network of Dark Friends. He almost orchestrates the defeat of the Forces of the Light and the breaking of Rand's spirit as well. He gets a 5 out of 5. As for special non-channeling abilities, he's probably the most powerful Dreamwalker in the series, with almost complete mastery and understanding of the world of dreams, and really also from a theoretical level. He has access to the vast Harangriel storage of the Forces of the Shadow, such as the Dream Spike and the like. He also possesses unmatched intelligence and knowledge from the Age of Legends, where he was a respected philosopher even then. Uh, he gets a 15 out of 15. Lastly, for channeling abilities, he is as strong as it is possible to be with the One Power, the equal of Rand and Luz Theron Telamon. He gets a 15 out of 15 here. In total, Moradin gets a 48 out of 50 and earns the number 2 spot on the list. The number 1 spot is probably no surprise to anyone, Randall Thor. Now, Rand is the Dragon Reborn, the most powerful Taviran of all time, champion of the light, an incredibly powerful user of the One Power, and he seemingly has the power of the Creator at the end of the series. Uh, so for fighting ability, Rand has mastered the sword, defeating several Blade Masters and earning the title himself in a very short period of time. He's almost unmatched with the sword, really. He also has trained in hand-to-hand -hand combat with the Aiel and proven very proficient there as well, able to kill with his bare hands. He fights multiple attackers at once and is rarely even touched. He gets a 5 out of 5 for fighting ability. For political power and influence, it's hard to picture a more powerful figure. He rules most of the Westlands by the end of the story. He leads the forces of the light. He's allied with every major power, including even the Shan Chan at the end of the story. He gets a 10 out of 10 here. For effectiveness, again, almost impossible to top. He unites most of the world, cleanses the taint from Sidene, defeats multiple Forsaken, defeats the Dark One, and even has the ability to kill the Dark One, uh, but chooses to reseal his prison instead. Rand gets a 5 out of 5 here. For special non-channeling abilities, Rand is the most powerful Taviran of all time, and the world literally seems to bend around him. He can influence events without even trying. Additionally, he has the knowledge of Luz Theron Telamon from the Age of Legends, a very skillful mind as a tactician, and more importantly, by the end of the story, he appears to have the ability to manipulate the pattern, lighting a pipe with a thought, making him supremely powerful. He gets a 15 out of 15 here. For channeling ability, he is the most powerful channeler of the One Power of all time, and easily takes a 15 out of 15 here. In total, Rand gets a perfect 50 out of 50 and earns the number one spot on my list of the most powerful characters in the Wheel of Time. What do you think of my list? Make sure to let me know in the comments below. I'm definitely interested to see your list. I will have the full list actually on my Patreon if you want to see all of the rankings. As promised though, before we wrap up, I wanted to give you guys a quick sneak peek at some of the website that we've been working on and ask for your help. As some of you have seen from the last live stream I did, and if you saw my posts on Twitter, we are busy trying to complete a new community Wheel of Time website. I wanted to give you guys a quick rundown of what features the site will have when it's completed and show you some of what has been completed already. So here's kind of a list of things that are going to be on there. We're going to have links to the community Wheel of Time content. So that's going to be YouTube videos, blogs, podcasts, as well as up-to-date information on the Wheel of Time TV show. We're going to have a completely updated wiki without any ads uh, and with links to video and audio content from content creators that help explain detailed parts of the series. The new wiki will be updated all the way to the end of the story, as some of the other wikis are not totally updated. Uh, it will also be formatted in a way that it will be, uh, that you can read the wiki and not be spoiled by later books. So if you're like reading Fires of Heaven, for instance, you can check out a character's wiki up to that point and then not go further so you won't be spoiled. So it'll be really helpful for new readers. There will be updated maps of every location in the series, including locations that we have never had maps of before. These maps are going to be interactive, meaning you can click on a place and bring up a more detailed local map, as well as links to the wiki on that specific location. So that should be really cool. There will be links and descriptions to the, all of the many Wheel of Time content creators that support the community. The goal will be for people to have a place to find someone to talk about the series with. There will be featured bios, links to their work, ways to get involved in the smaller subset communities around the Wheel of Time. So for instance, a Wheel of Time based podcast will have a bio page, links to their podcast, links to their Discord server if they have one, and links of how to support them financially. And at the end of the day, we want one place people can check to get everything Wheel of Time, including content creators. There will be a detailed book recap section with videos and maps made uh, for each chapter throughout the novels. There will be versions of this for people on their first time through the books, just recapping what they read. And then there will be more detailed chapter review videos and blogs that will detail the foreshadowing and the meaning of the events of the chapter, 
in greater context for the story. So this is sticking with the goal of making the site something for both old readers as well as new readers. Lastly, we're going to get battle maps. Uh, I, I'm really excited to have animated battle maps that will show you the movements of the armies, what happened during most of the famous battles from the Wheel of Time. If you want an event-by-event -event breakdown of Dumai's Wells or the last battle, then look no further than the battle maps that we are going to be making and the videos they're going to go with them. So those are just a few of the things that we're going to have up on the site. And those of us that have been working on the site cannot wait to get the full version live for you. Here's where you come in, though. Uh, we still need some help. Uh, there are a few costs associated with the creation of the site, including logo and design costs, hosting and domain fees, as well as some of the time uh, for people creating content for the site. We have started a GoFundMe page uh, to help fund some of these costs. I know many of you have already donated, and we thank you so much for the help. You have no idea what that means. But if you want to help support the creation of our community site, please take a look at the GoFundMe page. Uh, and what you, and it'll tell you there what your money would be used for uh, so you can consider donating. Uh, we will be listing uh, all of those that donate on the GoFundMe as founders for the site. And you will be featured on the About Me section of the website for eternity. Uh, unless you don't want to be. <laughs> uh, thanks to all of you who have already donated. The link to the GoFundMe is in the description of the video. Please check that out. Hey guys, also please like the video and subscribe to the channel to be updated when I release more Wheel of Time content. Thanks again for watching everybody, and until next time, peace out. Tinker in the kitchen with a job of work to do. Mistress up above, slipping on a robe of blue. She prances down the staircase, a fancy us a free crying. Tinker, oh dear, Tinker, won't you mend a pot for me?